What's going on, guys? So what are we doing here today? Another episode of the Talking Ish podcast, but we are also going live on Facebook and Instagram at the same time that we're recording the audio for this podcast episode. So uh, we are multimedia-ing the shit out of this thing. And uh, it's because we're excited. You know, it's draft time. Your fantasy draft is either probably this week or next week. I have one this week, I have two next week, and I am uh, ready to go. So I've made my tiers position by position, uh, like I do every year. You should always go into the draft with a tier-based system. And um, you can have my tiers. If you want a copy of them, send me an email, chris at chrisheller.me, and I will hook you up. If you have any questions, let me know, and uh, we'll get to it. So what we're going to do is roll through position by by position, go through my tiers. I'll mention essentially every relevant player. Uh, if you have any questions and you're watching on Instagram or Facebook, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, get ready, get your notebook, get your pen, because we are going to move super fast and we're going to roll through it. We're going to start with running backs, as running backs seem to be all the craze these days in uh, fantasy football. Tier one Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, and Todd Gurley. These are your top three picks, guys. Uh, regardless of format, this is how it's going this year. I am usually one to subscribe to heavy wide receivers in the first round. If you want to tell me that you're going to take Antonio Brown in the top three over one of these guys, I will listen to your, uh, to your point, and I will applaud the effort. However, this year, the volume that these guys get in both the run game and the pass game is just too good to pass up. For me, the order is Le'Veon Bell, then DJ, then Gurley. But, you know, you can't go wrong with any of those three workhorses at the top. Tier two, Alvin Kamara, Melvin Gordon, and Ezekiel Elliott. Kamara, the argument against is ridiculous off-the-charts efficiency last year. Uh, can he match that? Absolutely not. However, there's also going to be a definite increase in volume, especially with Ingram out um, the first four games. So... Kamara has a chance to take this job and completely run with it. Um, so he's going to be a lock first rounder again, no doubt. Melvin Gordon, I have him a little bit higher than most people. Not the most efficient guy, under four yards a carry, but incredible volume. I think the Chargers are an improving team. Second half of last year, the uh, offensive line was much improved, and Gordon is a goal line stud, and they use him in the passing game. So... Melvin Gordon, fifth overall for me, tier two. Ezekiel Elliott, I have him a little lower than most people. He's usually grouped with the top four. For me, I'm a little worried about the Cowboys. Offensive line injuries, no weapons on the outside to really speak of. Um, Zeke is an incredible talent, and obviously their line is good, but with the injuries right now to Fredericks and Martin, I'm a little concerned about Zeke, so I move him down to tier two and the bottom of it. Tier three, this is another great group. So right now we have about 10 guys in these first top three tiers that you can certainly count on for number one true bell cow status. Um, this group comes McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette, Saquon Barkley, Kareem Hunt, and Dalvin Cook. Here's the deal. Any one of these five can be your RB1. If you're picking at the back end of, the, of round one, you can probably grab two of them and have a leg up on your competition uh, in terms of touches out of the backfield. McCaffrey, I have him first, which is seventh overall running back. People are doubting McCaffrey, and that is a big mistake this year. What I look for in the first round with the guy who's going to be my number one running back is a high floor, high ceiling, and I'm already getting a yuck on McCaffrey from the uh, Instagram crowd over here. I see you, Zach. Um, here's the deal with McCaffrey. What I want out of my guy, my top guy, high floor, high ceiling. Last year, eight carries a game. Not the goal line back that was uh, Jonathan Stewart's role. Still finished as RB10 in PPR. 80 catches. So high floor, built in, right? Let's say he repeats, and, that, and that's as a rookie. So now you're talking an RB10 type of floor. Let's even call it RB15. But if you've watched preseason, you've seen this guy play, you've seen the talent there, we are looking at a potential top five pick next year. I think the ceiling here is a Marshall Falk Ray Rice type of season off the charts potential. That's why I have McCaffrey at the top of this group. Fournette, uh, same deal. Incredible rookie season, 
300 touches are a lock. And, and good news for Fournette is they've had him on the field uh, in third down situations early in the preseason, want to get him more involved. If he can give you 50 catches a game, I mean, he is a uh, monster up top. Barkley I have a little bit lower than uh, the consensus only because he's injured right now. These lower leg injuries in the preseason are a uh, little concerning, especially for a rookie. So for Barkley to produce as, you know, fifth overall running back, you are expecting a pretty much historic rookie season. And he's got the talent to do it. He's arguably the best uh, football prospect to come out of running back prospect to come out of college in, in a decade, maybe ever actually based on spark score and all these fancy metrics that these guys do. Kareem Hunt, great rookie season, led the league in rushing. Spencer Ware is back, a uh, new quarterback. However, he seems to be the bell cow. Again, all of these guys ending with Dalvin Cook, who was off to an incredible start four games through uh, his rookie season until he got the ACL tear. I put him at the bottom of this because I don't love guys coming off of um, that injury. And he's got Latavius Murray, who showed that he can really produce when given the opportunity so, um, you know, not sure that Dalvin Cook is going to get 350 touches like the rest of them, but an elite talent nonetheless. Tier four, all by himself, Devontae Freeman. Not quite good enough to be in this tier, uh, to tier three above, but better than everyone below him. Still would be happy with Freeman. If you're taking Antonio Brown or Beckham or Hopkins in the beginning, or sorry, the mid of round one, if Freeman is who's staring you in the face as your RB1 in round two, I could absolutely go to war with that. Tier five, Alex Collins, Jordan Howard, Rex Burkhead, Lamar Miller, and Joe Mixon. So here we have this group of RBs who are going to get a bunch of touches, maybe not so great out of the backfield. Start with Alex Collins. Last year really established, established himself as the guy in Baltimore. Does he catch passes or does he not? It seems to be a big debate uh, that I've been having and hearing all over the uh, interwebs by the experts over the last few weeks. The last, I want to say, seven weeks of the season, he caught like 20 passes, which would put him on a pace for close to 50. If Alex Collins is catching 40, 50 passes this year, you're looking at a true RB1. Plus, Baltimore is getting Yanda back up front. I have a sneaky suspicion that um, the Ravens are going to be pretty good this year. And they just like don't do it in an exciting way but Collins seems to be the dude. Jordan Howard, new offense in Chicago. Everyone is uh, very excited about the Bears' offense. I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit, but Jordan Howard versus Tariq Cohen, right? They're partners in the backfield here. A lot of people, smart people, like Tariq and think he can be used as uh, the same way that um, Nagy used um, Tyreek Hill in KC last year, just moving all around the all around the formation and maybe taking a little luster off the Jordan Howard shine. Jordan Howard though is consistent grinder. You're looking at 250 carries, probably 1100 yards, probably eight touchdowns. And if you believe in this offense could be more Rex Burkhead higher here than almost everywhere else that you see him. Uh, here's the deal. Love him as a player, had him on every single team last year. So I think he's just good at football, which is a, a requirement for some of my guys. Actually, not all. It's not sometimes, sometimes more about volume than uh, actual talent. Sony Michelle, top rookie that they picked in the first round, already hurt, hasn't been practicing, um, has fumble problems, can easily see him getting into uh, Belichick's doghouse early. Burkhead catches passes, is the goal line back. He can kind of do it all. Edelman's out the first four weeks, so maybe more passes for him. I think there, there's the, the upside or the ceiling with Burkhead is – Feature back on the New England Patriots, a team that obviously scores a shit ton of points. And the last two years, uh, when you combine all of their guys together, so James White and Deion Lewis and Burkhead, if you put them all into one, they have the second most running back points in the league. So this slot for Rex is super high, and I might be overdrafting him for sure, but that's what I'm feeling with my guy here. Lamar Miller and Joe Mixon. Uh, Lamar Miller. So... Not an elite talent, but last year with Deshaun Watson in the games that he played, Miller was a RB1. And Dante Foreman tore his ACL last year, or tore his Achilles, sorry. Um, I should be familiar. That's the one main injury I've had in my lifetime. Um, so Foreman is going to be slow coming back. If Foreman was healthy, I would say he's going to steal this job from Miller this year, but it looks like that is not going to happen. Offensive line a little shaky, but we want opportunity. We want touches, and uh, that's what you're going to get with Miller. Similar with Mixon, although 
Mixon has Gio Bernard, who I'm a big fan of, behind him to take third down work. And if they want to play hurry up, if uh, they're down and Bengals might not be a great team, you might see more of Gio than Mixon. I do believe in the talent of Mixon, and I believe that the Bengals will have an improved offensive line. Tier 6, Mark Ingram, Jarek McKinnon, LaShawn McCoy, Kenyon Drake, Jamal Williams, Deion Lewis, and Derek Henry. Ingram, obviously suspended first four games. If he wasn't, he would be much higher on this list. Jarek McKinnon, early darling, early injury, slid down the list here. So McKinnon's been a guy that the last couple of years I've been a huge fan of and wanted him to get the opportunity. Now he got the opportunity, uh, signed to a big contract by the 49ers, and I think he is a little overdrafted these days. You know, He was moving up to the mid-second round, early third for sure. Now with his injury, you're probably going to lose a little shine on him. But talented, I just think that Breda and now Alfred Morris might be the value in San Fran. I don't know if McKinnon can hold up to be that true workhorse. LaShawn McCoy, probably not going to be on any of my teams. Obviously, the opportunity is there. I'll get a ton of touches. I think that team is going to be absolutely atrocious. Uh, I want no part of that Buffalo offense. I think the line is terrible. I think the off the quarterback is rookie is a rookie. And I think McCoy has already come out and said like he doesn't want that much volume because he wants to preserve his hopefully Hall of Fame career. So I'm off of McCoy. Kenyon Drake, he's growing on me a little bit. Uh, I still think Frank Gore will be in there and get some opportunity. Drake was impressive at the end of last year. Um, my first, I, he's, he's at a spot in my board where I think he'll be gone before I have to make the, uh, make the um, choice to draft him or not. I think I'm going to probably let him slide in most cases, or he'll be off the board rather. Jamal Williams. So I have him a little bit higher here than the consensus. And the feeling here is I want a piece of the Green Bay offense. Williams is good in pass pro. He's a hard-nosed runner. And Aaron Jones is out the first two games. Aaron Jones, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, I'm a big fan of. He certainly passed the eye test last year. He was incredible when he was on the field. But Jamal Williams gets the shot to be Aaron Rodgers' top dog right off the bat in an offense that's going to score points. So uh, I want a piece of that. Deion Lewis and Derrick Henry. Tough situation here. If either one of these guys were to go down, the other one becomes a, a top 15 RB without a doubt. Both really solid talents. And I think both of them, just like uh, Kamara and Ingram, they can both have value uh, each game, day one. I think game flow will dictate what goes on here. I think they're both going to touch the ball. I think it might be a little frustrating because you'll see the talent. You'll see these guys breaking through and having big games, but you just don't know when one of them is going to take over versus the other. Um, in those scenarios, I like to take the guy who's cheaper, and in this case, it's Deion Lewis. Tier 7. As we move on, we're going to talk a little bit less about each guy because they're going to get you know a little more no-name types. So we're still in uh, some relevant guys here in Tier 7, starting with Marshawn Lynch. Guy can still do it. End of last year was a solid RB2 for the last you know six weeks of the season. Oakland, if you believe in Gruden, you believe that they're going to be an improved offense. I think they're going to be... Uh, better. I don't know if they're going to be great, but Lynch can still get it done, guys. Don't uh, lose, lose the uh, ageism here. We're going, to, we're going to be happy to have Marshawn Lynch on our team this year. Peyton Barber. So the way that uh, average draft position is going right now, I think Peyton Barber and Ronald Jones, the uh, heralded rookie out of USC, are going to flip spots, essentially. So depending on when you're drafting, you're drafting soon. Barber still might be floating around in that seventh, eighth round. Um, more than likely by the time you draft, he's going to be more in that 5-6 area, swapping with Jones. And Barber seems to be the guy. Jones is just not getting it. Charles Sims is on the IR, so there's a lot of opportunity there in a pretty decent offense once uh, Jameis Winston comes back. Shout out Wu-Tang Forever from my guy, 2002 guy over there. No doubt. Keep going. Bilal Powell, I have him higher than almost everyone here. Now let me tell you why. Guys that I like to like to have on my team in my backfield are those that have standalone value, even if they're in a committee, as Bilal Powell does. He's certainly, at the least, the uh, receiving back on the Jets with Crowell in front of him. But also, in case of a Crowell injury, has the potential to be a true three-down back. Bilal Powell has done it before. He's getting first-team reps. Crowell is a little injured. Jets may be keeping him in bubble wrap just to keep him safe for the uh, season, but this could be Bilal Powell's backfield. And even if it's not, he still provides decent flex value on a weekly basis. I have him a lot higher clearly here than everyone else. Royce Freeman, Royce Freeman, 
the uh, hyped up rookie in Denver competing with Devonte Booker and uh, another rookie, Philip Lindsay, showing a lot of signs in camp right now. Um, Freeman is really climbing. I mean, I think by draft day, he might be middle to back of the third round type of back. He's probably going to win this job at some point throughout the season. I think Booker will be in the mix at the beginning, but I think Lindsay could be the third down back um, before we know it. So I don't know that Royce Freeman becomes a full three down guy and where you're going to have to take him. I'm probably going to let him slide, but behind Saquon Barkley, I probably see him being the next best rookie when it's all said and done this year. Jay Ajayi, a little lower than the consensus has him. I think Eagles like to spread it around. I think uh, Corey Clement's a decent player. Sproles back in the fold. I don't trust Jay Ajayi's legs. Uh, I think he came in with into the league with a, a degenerative knee condition, and um, at some point, that's going to, to stop. He's super efficient. There's a really good offensive line. So, like, when he's on the field and when he's getting 60% of the touches, he's probably a solid RB2. I just don't know when that's going to be, and I don't know if I trust – that situation right now. So I'm probably not going to have a Jai on my teams. Tevin Coleman, uh, the the 1B to Devontae Freeman's 1A in Atlanta, a super talent, a free agent next year. He's probably going to be a uh, RB1 on some other team next year, whoever goes out and signs him. Tevin Coleman, similar to Bilal Powell, he's got standalone um, week-to-week value. And if Freeman ever were ever to go down, you have a three-back stud. Chris Thompson coming off an injury in Washington. Uh, now with Darius Geist, the rookie going down, Chris Thompson's value gets a little bit a little bit of a bump. Last year, he was a top 10 RB before he went down with the injury. Um, a super jump off the page type of talent last year. I was incredibly impressed every time I watched the uh, the Redskins play ball. So Thompson is, Thompson is really climbing up of draft boards right now. He is probably you know, going to be a fifth rounder by draft day. In PPR leagues, I, I have no problem with that, other than the fact, the fact that he came out and said that he might not be 100% until November. Um, you know, I heard a doctor, a football doctor I respect yesterday say that that just is like a mental thing. Physically, he should be all good before then. Carlos Hyde, somebody that I thought I was not going to be drafting. Uh, he's... he's uh, I'm, I'm thinking again about Carlos Hyde. He's been super impressive. It seems like the rookie Nick Chubb is not going to be a factor, and I like the Browns' offense. Hyde uh, in Tier 7. Chris Carson taking the Seahawks job and uh, literally running with it, uh, beating out the rookie Rashad Penny, who also has a thumb injury right now, so may or may not be ready for Week 1. Carson is a hard-nosed guy, hard-nosed runner. Pete Carroll and staff have, seen, have said nothing but amazing things about him uh, all through camp. So he's someone that you wanted to use as an RB1 or an RB2 that you can get like in the seventh, eighth round. Nice value there. Duke Johnson, you know, a lock for 50, 60 catches. That's somebody I want on my team in a PPR league for sure. Marlon Mack. The Colts backfield is an interesting situation here. Fix my camera. What's wrong with my camera? How's that, Instagram over there? I got Facebook and I got audio going here. I can't be messing up. I see myself perfectly in the camera here. Anyway, let me know if there's any technical difficulties out there, though. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. So where were we? Marlon Mack. Injured, right? Uh, supposed to be back by week one. He may be the guy here. And I think Andrew Luck in this offense is going to be a, a thing. I think they're, they're, their division is not that difficult. They're going to have to score a lot of points their defense is not great their line is not great um still all i see is eyes and a hat maybe it is it possible it's on your end how's that <laughs> appreciate the love over there guys all right geo bernard a big fan of geo bernard backing up mixon fits into that category of standalone value plus uh upside if mixon were to go down when given the opportunity bernard is always always a productive productive player Tier eight, starting with Carrion Johnson, the rookie in Detroit. Now, skill set wise, super uh, impressive. The problem here is they signed Blunt. They have Riddick, who are very good at what they do, and that's running the ball into the end zone and catching passes out of the backfield. Two things that I want my running back to be able to do. So, Carrion Johnson, I think the hype will outweigh. I think it's style over substance, and most likely he will not end up. Um, on my squad in that respect. Aaron Jones, mentioned him before when talking about Jamal Williams. 
his talent really jumped off the page last year for me. The the two game suspension is a killer because I think he could have taken this job and uh, not not looked back. But we'll see. Maybe the second half of the year he's someone to target as a guy who's going to uh, you know talent his way to that top role. Rashad Penny, the rookie out of Seattle, we just talked about with Carson. Talented. I don't know why they took him in the first round at pick 27 overall if they're not going to use him. You like to think that talent will win out. Uh, that's Penny over Carson. Carson was a seventh-round pick. So I believe that at some point in the season, Penny gets at least a shot. I don't think the Seahawks are going to be that great of a team this year. Their defense is not like it used to be. They're going to have to score points. They're going to have to throw the ball. That leans more towards Penny and even C.J. Procise's uh, skill set rather than Chris Carson. Ty Montgomery. Back to the Packers. Again, we saw what he could do in the first month of last season before getting hurt and giving way to Aaron Jones and then Jamal Williams. So if he gets the opportunity, um, there's a lot of upside here with Ty Montgomery, especially since he used to be a wide receiver and there's not that much talent in the Packers wide out. So you can see Montgomery being used all across the formation. Crowell, we spoke about a little bit. Uh, I'm more interested in Powell in that backfield. Matt Breda. This is where I think the value might lie in San Fran. He might be a guy that I uh, am really interested in ahead of Jarek McKinnon. Obviously, Jarek McKinnon is going to be drafted a lot higher than Matt Breda, but Breda's a talent. He showed it last year, and if you're thinking that he's the Tevin Coleman to McKinnon's Devontae Freeman in a uh, Kyle Shanahan offense, then that's a pretty good place to be. Sony Michel, the rookie we spoke about with Burkhead uh, on the Patriots, we don't know. He's a question mark. Obviously, he's a first-round talent. The Patriots are not commonly taking running backs in the first round, nor nor should they, really. So the fact that they took him that high was a surprise, um, but maybe that means they see something really special there, and at some point in the season, he could be relevant. I just don't think he'll end up on my squads this year. Ronald Jones, we talked about again with uh, Peyton Barber, the rookie out of USC. His burst jumps off the screen. I saw him make a couple plays um, recently. Even though he's getting total shit from the critics in uh, preseason thus far, there have been some impressive plays. No openings for him. You know, if you if you go by the thing that that talent wins out, uh, you never know that Ronald Jones halfway through the season could be someone that we all want on our rosters. And Tariq Cohen, we talked about him with Jordan Howard before. Uh, you know, could catch 50 passes in a PPR league, be flex value. Tier 9, Adrian Peterson, James White, Devontae Booker, Robert Turbin, Naheem Hines, Theo Riddick, Chris Ivory, Latavius Murray, TJ Yeldon, Corey Clement, Alfred Morris, CJ Anderson, and Frank Gore. I'm not going to go through all these guys. I would just stand out a couple. Adrian Peterson, uh, back from the dead and potentially 200 carry running back uh, out in Washington now that Darius Geis went down. Football moves fast, guys. Robert Turbin is someone I want to bring up. When I was talking about Marlon Mack and the Colts' backfield, Turbin suspended the first four games. Um, between Mack, Wilkins, Hines, I don't know that anyone grabs that and runs with it. Um, I think there's potential for Robert Turbin to come back and take over this backfield uh, from Week 5 on. And Tier 10, Devante, Dante Foreman, Eckler, Chubb, J Jalen Rashard, Jordan Wilkins, Spencer Ware, Darren Sproles, Javorius Allen, Kenneth Dixon, Wayne Gallman, Corey Grant, P. Ryan, and Kelly. Not that interested there. You know, whatever you like, you go and grab your guy and uh, hope for the best. Those are lottery ticket types. We'll take a sip of water as we uh, move on to wide receivers. I told you we're going to move fast, guys. We're in for a... Uh, a long one here with the receivers, and then we'll fly through tight ends and QBs. Tier 1, wide receivers. Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham, and DeAndre Hopkins. Obviously, we all know what Antonio Brown is doing in the middle of a all-time Hall of Fame career. Odell Beckham, highest paid player, highest paid receiver in football as of today. Can't go wrong with Beckham. And the, uh, DeAndre Hopkins could push for 200 targets on that team. It's ridiculous how... Um, how little there is for Watson to throw to outside of Hopkins and Fuller. And we'll talk about Fuller in a little bit. Um, so for me, out of this tier, these are all, these are all, all three are first-round picks for sure. Odell still has that 
ridiculous all-time ceiling in a season for me. Like he's the one guy who I think at any given year could have, you know, 115 catches, 1900 yards and 16 touchdowns. Like one of the greatest seasons ever for a uh, receiver. So if Odell's around at the back end of the first, uh, I'm, I'm all in on building my team around him and around a wide receiver. Tier two, and I love this tier as well. Uh, I'll be happy with any of these guys as my wide receiver one. Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, A.J. Green, T.Y. Hilton, and Stefan Diggs. Julio, obviously, we need some more touchdowns, guy. 1,400 yards, four years in a row. I think the Atlanta offense um, – bounces back for sure from what they were um last year two years ago you recall they were in the super bowl and matt ryan was the mvp you know how quickly things change don't let recency bias get in the way of uh smart thinking here michael thomas two years in one of the most consistent wide receivers in the league and off to an incredible start historically uh keenan allen can't go wrong going to potentially you know he'll be top five in targets for sure um especially with uh, the tight end, um, Hunter Henry going down for the year. Uh, Keenan, the last seven weeks of the season last year was an absolute monster potential for, you know, top three wide receiver here. AJ Green. Yes. I'm putting him in this category, even though he's uh 30 or almost 30. Um, the guy, when he plays, he just, he's one of the, he's one of the best wide receivers we've ever seen play technically, dude. I've been such an AJ Green fan, always have been, and I think that offense uh, takes a takes a step up this year from what they were last year. Dalton did not throw that many passes, and even when AJ Green was on the field last year, he still is he's always a wide receiver one almost every single game he plays. Um, don't sleep on him. You can get him now at the back end of the second round. It seems kind of ridiculous. T.Y. Hilton with luck back and throwing the ball 600 times. T.Y. Hilton's going to push 150 targets. Because the other the other offensive weapons around there are all questionable. Ty is a legit wide receiver one, and maybe a surprise here. Stephon Diggs in this category. I'm a huge Diggs guy. Before he got hurt last year, he was the wide receiver one in all of football. Uh, some guys I really respect have compared his skill set to Antonio Brown, and uh, you know, anytime I see him on the field, he is just a fantastic football player, and um, he's a guy that if you can get in the middle of the th- third round beginning of the third round i'll take that all day tier three Devontae adams adam thielen and doug baldwin Devontae adams obviously slides into uh the true number one aaron Rodgers guy still has never had over a thousand yards though so you know there's a little bit of question about his skill set that's why i have him a a tier below where he's probably going to be drafted i just think the other guys are better football players he might lead the league in touchdowns um i just don't think he's going to have a hundred catches Thielen, he may have 100 catches. And if you want to say Thielen's your guy on the Vikings over Diggs, I am not going to argue, especially Thielen's going to be playing in the slot, so that uh, you know lends itself to a lot of receptions. And Doug Baldwin, the injury is scary. He um, hasn't played, so we don't know. Are they keeping him in bubble wrap until the season starts? That's my guess. Uh, you know, You hear that he's running on the sidelines and that everything is okay and he's going to be fine day one. Obviously, Pete Carroll is tough to believe in that sense. Everything is all smelling like roses in Seattle, uh, according to him. If Baldwin is healthy, um, they lost Richardson, they lost Jimmy Graham. There is Doug Baldwin could push for 150 targets himself. And if he does that, he's a technician on the field. He's got an incredible quarterback. He can have you know 115 catches, Doug Baldwin, and potentially lead the league in receptions if he stays healthy. Tier four. Mike Evans, Tyreek Hill, Larry Fitzgerald, Amari Cooper, Jarvis Landry, Chris Hogan, and Juju Smith-Schuster. Mike Evans, probably not going to be on any of my teams this year. Um, I've always thought he was a bit overrated. Obviously, he's a touchdown scorer, incredible in the red zone, incredible size, and Jameis likes to chuck it. Uh, So I, I get it, but they're just guys that I think are better football players where you have to take him. You know, he's in that two, three turn between, you know, picks 22 and 27. I just like all these other guys we spoke about more. Tyreek Hill. He was on my don't, I'm probably not going to draft list um, when I did that podcast, you know, three weeks ago. So all the science um, tells me stay away, but there's just something here that I'm feeling that I don't know, man. 
I know preseason is not incredibly vital in terms of stats, but last game, 8 for 88 on 8 targets. That massive touchdown against Atlanta that Mahomes just chucked it downfield and he just outran everybody. He seems to defy logic. And I'm just like, I don't know. I'm getting those feels. So, you know, a couple weeks ago, I would say you want Tyreek as your wide receiver too in the th- in the middle of the third round. I would have said, eh, better options. But if he's your guy and you're getting that feeling uh, in your special place, I'm not going to fight you anymore. That's what I'm saying with Tyreek Hill. Larry Fitzgerald, can't go wrong. Old, reliable, uh, and old doesn't really matter in his case. He'll be in the slot. He'll have Sam Bradford to start, who is a perfect QB for him. I think we're in for another year of 100 catches of Larry Fitzgerald. Incredible value in the middle of the fourth round. Amari Cooper, polarizing individual, considering first two years were historic. Last year was an abomination. I should know. I drafted him uh, on the wrap in my highest stakes league at 12-13, and uh, I did not reap the benefits as he had, I think, 48 catches the whole season. What a complete debacle, but he's only 24. Gruden's coming in saying he's going to be the guy. He's going to be more in the slot. He could potentially lead the league in, in targets. That's how much they might feature him. Um, I'm buying in, but not all the way. I think if you buy in all the way, you're going to have to take him in the early to mid third. I'm hoping in one of my leagues, I have the 11th pick. I'm hoping he's around at that 3-4 turn, um, and we'll see. I'm willing to to bet on the talent of a 24-year-old stud like that, but certainly last year was concerning. Jarvis Landry, the star of Hard Knocks, switching teams over to Cleveland, super volume dependent. Uh, it's always a little scary going uh, for a new receiver with a new quarterback and a new team. However, Landry's the type of guy that, for me, even when when experts were saying Landry is so uh, inefficient or you know catches five-yard passes and falls to the ground. Anytime I watch him play, I'm impressed as just purely a football player, not even talking fantasy football. He's just got this toughness and this skill. Um, I just like want him on my team. So I'm uh, I'm in for Landry in the uh, you know early to mid fourth round, a uh, little higher than people have him. Although with the Josh Gordon question mark, I feel that Landry is slowly climbing up draft boards. Chris Hogan, probably a lot higher here than he's been, although he's creeping up as well. Pretty simply, Tom Brady's number one target, um, a top 10 wide receiver last year in the first eight weeks of the season before going down with injury. Edelman out and not much behind him. You're talking Philip Dorsett and uh, Cordero Patterson. You know, obviously Gronk is there. That's uh, a win for the whole offense. Um, I love Hogan. I think he's super undervalued and can be a solid wide receiver two uh, that you can get as a wide receiver three in the maybe fifth round. I'm probably going to pull the trigger in the fourth if I had that opportunity. And Juju Smith-Schuster, um, incredible rookie season, incredibly efficient, almost off the charts efficient. So that would be the knock against him. But in preseason, one catch for 71 yards and a touchdown, one catch for four yards and a touchdown. The dude uh, is super talented on a high-powered offense. And if Antonio Brown were to miss any time, you have a top 10 guy, which uh, you always like. Tier 5. Golden Tate, Josh Gordon, Randall Cobb, Julian Edelman, and Allen Robinson. This is an interesting little group here. Golden Tate, we know what he can do, right? He's the uh, 90 catch every year. Stafford, a team that loves to throw the ball, a good quality QB. Um, So Tate's somebody who absolutely can play for me. He's not super sexy, but he's a guy that gets the job done every single year. Josh Gordon, you know, this pick, no matter where he lands, is either a – a home run or a total bust, there's kind of not much in between, right? If he's on the field, he's a high-end wide receiver too, I think, at the low. Um, With Tyrod Taylor or Baker Mayfield, maybe halfway through the season, this guy is just a a specimen and incredible football player, or he might play zero games. It's it's that wide of range. No no one's had a lower lower floor and a higher ceiling in in one human – that I can ever remember, really. It's unbelievable. Randall Cobb, uh, an incredible value in my mind. He's Aaron Rodgers' wide receiver, too, bottom line. And he's a little undervalued because, A, he's a slot guy. People think that he, you know, there was Jordy and Devontae Adams and then Cobb. They don't realize that. When Cobb's on the field with Rodgers, he's a wide receiver, too, almost every game. Five catches, 75 yards, half a touchdown are like his averages with Rodgers playing. Um, 
I just want a piece of Aaron Rodgers, and I'm not going to take him because I don't take QBs because QBs are silly. We'll talk about them uh, for five seconds at the end of this. Um, so I'm going to overdraft Cobb all day. Julian Edelman. Obviously, th- this goes along with you know your risk tolerance and the way that you're shaping your football team. If you're super heavy on wide receiver up top, and Edelman can be your wide receiver four or five or even six that you can get in the seventh, eighth round, then I'm all in. Because I think when he comes back, He's still going to be Brady's safety blanket and going to catch his six, seven passes a game and uh, be a solid wide receiver too when he returns. Allen Robinson, moving over to Chicago. So I have a tough time uh, evaluating A-Rob this year. An incredible talent two years ago, three years ago, sorry, when he burst onto the scene with Jacksonville and Blake Bortles, uh, then fell off the planet. I don't know what happened. And then... Last year, the injury week one. So, you know, devastating for his uh, young, flourishing career. Now he moves over to a new offense, new QB. It seems to be that if you're excited about Chicago, you're excited about Allen Robinson, and you think that he's going to be the guy and push, you know, 130, 140 targets. Um, I'm not buying in fully to the Bears offense, and therefore I think Robinson will probably go off the board before I am willing to take him um that's just me if you if you want to say that you you believe in trubisky and you believe in uh the bears and nagy then go for it but um i think there's better guys in that area or guys that i like more tier six will fuller demarius thomas emmanuel sanders robert woods and marvin jones so let's talk about will fuller for a second if there was no hamstring injury which there is as of a few days ago um i was super Super excited to draft Will Fuller on every one of my teams. Third-year guy that I think is completely miscast as a as public perception views him as a burner, deep threat, and that's it. When in reality, he's a top 10 pick with a pedigree, 6'3", 215 pounds, killed it at the combine the only knock on him physically is not huge hands that you like to see on a guy of that size but he is a burner nonetheless like he seems to have on paper the total package he's got hopkins a wide receiver one taking the other team's best db and he's got not much competition in terms of the slot receivers or the tight ends or running backs out of the backfield like i think he can if healthy fall over and have 125 targets. And we saw, obviously this is not sustainable, but we saw what Watson to um, Fuller could do last year in the games Watson was healthy. He was he was scoring two touchdowns every game. I mean, it was absurd. Obviously, I don't think Watson's going to do that again. It's impossible, essentially. But I, I love Will Fuller as a value this year, and I think a breakout is imminent if healthy. I hate a hamstring injury going into the season. It's really tearing me up right now. Broncos wide receivers, Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. You kind of know what you're going to get. Reliable, uh, improved playing QB. I think Denver will be a little better than you expect. Because I have them ranked back to the back, Sanders is my guy there because you can get him a round and a half to two and a half rounds later than Demarius. So I think the value is in Sanders. Robert Woods. I have him first out of the Rams receivers, and I think he's being drafted third. Uh, Cooks is definitely going before him in almost every single league I've seen. And people are really, really in love with Cooper Cup, which I kind of get the love. But Robert Woods, man, last year, Robert Woods was a complete stud, (laughs) bottom line. And having a little audio difficulty here with uh, the podcast. Back to you here. Um, Robert Woods last year, when healthy, was fantastic. You know, coming over to a new team in the Sean McVay offense, I just think he's incredibly underrated. I think... You undervalued, actually. You can get him in the eighth, ninth round, and I think he should be more of that five, six round tier. And Marvin Jones, Stafford's, you want to call it wide receiver one, not exactly, but uh, an impressive frame on a team that's going to throw the ball a lot. He's going to be on the field all day long. Uh, We'll talk about his competition creeping up in a minute. Um, But you can't go wrong with Marvin Jones in the fifth round. Tier seven. This This one's pretty interesting, this tier. Marquise Goodwin. Allegedly, Jimmy Garoppolo's wide receiver one in uh, San Fran, not Pierre Garçon. I have Pierre Garçon in this tier too, in this tier as well. 
So we'll um, we can talk about both of them at the same time here. What do you think that what do you think is going to happen in San Fran this year? You're buying into Shanahan and you're buying into Garoppolo. If you are like I am, I think both of these guys are a value in the seventh, eighth round. I think Goodwin has that higher ceiling that you saw at the end of last year. He's a speed demon. He can get by you. He can score touchdowns when Garcon has always been a receptions guy. So I'm fine with either one of these dudes in the seventh, eighth round as your you know, wide receiver four, let's say, or if you're going running back heavy up top, wide receiver three. I like both of their value here. Sammy Watkins. And this one's tough for me because I'm a uh, Sammy Watkins truther, I'm a Sammy Watkins apologist. Um, I don't think Sammy's going to be on my team this year. I'm just not seeing the fit over there with Tyreek and Kelsey and Hunt. Um, it seems that early reports of that Watkins is not kind of getting it right off the bat um, in camp and maybe not clicking with Mahomes the way he should. So that all of this worries me. I still think Sammy is an incredible talent and they gave him money. So like they're going to try to make it work. I'm just not willing to bet on it right there where you need to take him. I think somebody's going to fall in love with the talent or already love the talent like I do, but willing to take him a little higher than I am. And I'm probably not going to get him. Crabtree and John Brown. Let's talk about them together. So similar to the Denver receivers, John Brown, you can get five rounds later uh, than Crabtree. I think he presents one of the best values in the league in terms of wide receiver value this year for uh, for receivers. I think Brown could lead. Um, he was a great player two, three years ago. I was very high on him in Arizona. Then he had the sickle cell anemia thing that just kind of messed up his whole career. And now he seems to be healthy. All reports are that he's killing it in camp. He's been great in the preseason. Flacco actually looked pretty good throwing on the ball, which is uh, an impressive feat. Um, so I'm all over John Brown as an incredible value here. Kenny Galladay talked about him or teased him a minute ago when talking about Marvin Jones. I'm in love with Kenny Galladay. <laughs> I'll, say, <laughs> I'll say it again. Um, I'm in love with Kenny Galladay. Now, how does he get to uh, fantasy relevance this year? How does that happen? Word on the street is, a uh, recent word, is that he has been in two, two receiver sets on the field with Marvin Jones in place of Golden Tate. And Golden Tate's just running in three receiver sets, three receiver sets, which is what um, the, the Detroit likes to run. Point, point being, I think Galladay is going to be on the field more than you might expect. And he's 6'4", he's 225 pounds. People are calling him Babytron. Uh, I think he's a star in the making. And somehow he's going to uh, make a dent this year and be someone that we're really, really looking out for come 2019 drafts. So I would say, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th round, wherever, depending on what type of league you're in, draft Kenny, Kenny Galladay. Cooper Cup, we spoke about a minute ago, and Cooks, uh, back to back here. Um, Cooks is not going to be on any of my teams. And he's moving into the Sammy Watkins role. And Sammy was uh, a little disappointing last year. Plus, Cooks is going from Drew Brees to Tom Brady to Jared Goff. Um, I'm just not interested at, you know, fourth, fifth round where you have to take Cooks. You know, it's more of a uh, name brand thing on his value. And um, I'm going to pass. Cooper Cup, I could see him playing for me. One of the, surprisingly, one of the top red zone targeted receivers in the league last year uh, as a rookie. So, him and Goff are, are clicking, and uh, I get I, I've seen Cup taken, you know, as high as the fifth round in some leagues by some pretty smart people. Um, you know, I'm not that high on him, but I, I kind of get the narrative. Alshon Jeffrey, much lower here than most people have him. Um, already hurt. He's not going to be on any of my teams this year. That's how we're playing Alshon Jeffrey, uh, plain and simple. I just think the Eagles spread it around. Um, I gave a stat a couple weeks ago on the podcast that he's like one of my guys that I'm not going to draft. And he was a, um, I think it's 22 games in a row without going over 100 yards or something. Just Alshon's not the guy for me this year. Jamison Crowder, he could be the guy for me because he could be the guy for Alex Smith. Um, depending on Jordan Reed's health, Crowder with um, you know Richardson and Doxon, new and unproven, respectively, on the outside in Washington. Uh, Crowder could be that safety blanket that Alex Smith tends to like in the middle of the field and could push 90 catches. Robbie Anderson. A uh, you know high flyer speedster on the Jets with McCown and maybe Darnold, uh, some legal troubles there, but he's a guy that I'm willing to take a shot on. Last last half or last month of the season, we were looking at a you know 
wide receiver two on a weekly basis. He was super impressive. Uh, I think the Jets offense might be a little better than we expect. They're going to have to throw because they're probably going to be playing catch up a lot of the times. Um, so Robbie Anderson in the you know eighth round, I can totally live with that. Tier eight, Kenny Stills. I don't know why his draft draft position, average draft position, has not um, crept up recently. He's still floating around that eleventh, twelfth round, and I don't get it. For me, he's the wide receiver one on Miami, and Miami is a team that's going to have to throw the ball. I don't believe in Devontae Parker, and he's hurt. Otherwise, they have slot guys like Amendola and Wilson. I think Stills is a real a real football player. Um, wide receiver two upside, but a solid wide receiver three that you can draft as a wide receiver five. Not really getting it with Stills, so he's somebody to target. Corey Davis, lower than uh, most people have him. Super talent, second year. Um, everyone thinks the Titans offense is going to be improved. I get it. I just haven't seen it yet in the pros. And I just don't feel that Davis is going to be that dude, at least not yet. So I think he's a little overhyped based on last year's draft, uh, equity and profile. Devin Funches, Carolina. So Funches is an interesting case because at the end of last year, he finally, you know, after Olsen went down, he, um, really grew into his role, became a touchdown scorer. Um, one of Cam's targets. Right now they have Olsen back. They have Run CMC, a.k.a. Derry Sanders in the backfield. They've got um, DJ Moore, the heralded rookie. they got Curtis Samuel coming back. A lot more distribution of targets. Um, however, Funches should, with a 6'4 frame, 215, he should be the number one guy and should establish himself. I just don't think he's incredibly skilled. However, He's a type of guy that I'm certainly willing to take a chance on in the seventh, eighth round if he's uh, if he's staring me in the face there. Nelson Aguilar, I'd rather have him three rounds later than Alshon Jeffrey, bottom line. Tyler Lockett, I'm into Tyler Lockett in the 11th, 12th round as a guy playing with Russell Wilson. Like I said, so many vacated targets in, in Seattle with um, Richardson moving out, with Jimmy Graham moving out. I think Lockett, again, like Will Fuller, can fall into 115, 120 targets. And we've seen in a short frame his rookie year and a little bit in year two what Lockett is capable of when getting targeted. So I think Lockett is somebody that, uh, you know, you could do a lot worse than him in the late rounds. Chris Godwin is another one. Uh, out of Penn State, profile of a stud wide receiver one. Rumor has it that he's going to be playing as the wide receiver two, not Deshaun Jackson in Tampa. So Godwin... Godwin might be, when it's all said and done, the best wide receiver on Tampa. I am uh, talking to you, Mike Evans. So Godwin is certainly somebody, you know, 11th, 12th round, depending on the league and the guys you're playing with, somebody that you'd want to roster because he could be that second-year breakout. Tyrell Williams. I don't know what happened to Tyrell Williams last year. I, I have no explanation for it. He played in a good offense with a good QB, with Keenan Allen taking up uh, – much of the def defense's attention, and he just totally did not come through. Um, I'm pulling for a rebound this year. I think Tyrell had the talent, and like I said, I like that offense a lot. Um, I think he's going to surprise, and I'm absolutely willing to pull the trigger on him You know, in the latter half of the draft where there's a ton of upside as a wide receiver, too, in San Diego with a lot of talent there. Cam Meredith, if he falls, in, if he falls into that Marcus Colston big slot receiver role for Drew Brees, you're looking at an incredible, incredible value. Jordy Nelson, if you believe in Amari Cooper, if you believe in John Gruden, if you believe in the Raiders' offense, why don't we believe in Jordy Nelson? He's somebody who's been growing on me a bit here, and obviously I'm not going to count on him, but 10th, 11th round, maybe he hasn't lost it. We know he's a great red zone threat, and we know Amari Cooper is capable of acquiescing to his uh, – cohort across the field as he did with Crabtree the last couple of years, right? So it's possible that Jordy is is a value there. Tier nine, and again, just like the running backs, we're kind of going to go fast here through these last couple tiers and then uh, move on to tight ends and QB, and then we'll get you out of here for the day. Devontae Parker, Kelvin Benjamin, Keelan Cole, Sterling Shepard, Rashard Matthews, Paul Richardson, Alan Hearns, Geronimo Allison, Michael Gallup. So let's start at the bottom here, and just we'll just touch on a couple people. Michael Gallup, as a rookie, I think he could lead the um, he could lead the Cowboys in targets as a rookie, which obviously is not common. But their wide receiver core is so weak right now with Hearns and Beasley 
uh, that Gallup seems to be impressing in camp, and he could be the dude when it's all said and done. Geronimo Allison, you want a piece of Aaron Rodgers, bottom line, and he seems to be the third guy right now, the second wide out. So most times they're going to three wide receiver set. It's going to be Allison, Adams, and Cobb in the slot. You get Allison on the field or anyone on the field 80% of the time with Aaron Rodgers, you want a piece of that in the 13th, 14th round. He does have some real talented rookies in uh, Jamon Moore and Equinonymous. I can't even pronounce that name, St. Brown, um, nipping at his heels. But for now, Allison is the guy, and Rodgers has said he knows where to be, and Rodgers wants that. Keelan Cole, with Marquise Lee going down in Jacksonville, Keelan Cole at the end of last year was super impressive and can potentially be that guy now that Marquise Lee is probably out for the year. Uh, if he's the wide receiver one, I don't think the game script is going to be as favorable in Jacksonville for to run the ball all day, all night like they did last year. Bortles is going to have to throw, and Keelan Cole could be that big play guy. Tier 10, Kirk, Josh Doxson, DJ Moore, Anthony Miller, John Ross, Calvin Ridley, Quincy Anunua, Taiwan Taylor, Ryan Grant. Let's start with Ryan Grant, actually. So like we said before with T.Y. Hilton, we think that the Colts are going to have to throw the ball a bunch this year, and they don't have much outside of T.Y. Hilton. If Grant is the wide receiver too there, uh, he, he can fall into 100 targets, and that's what we want, people who are touching the ball, bottom line. Um, Quincy Anunua, I'm a huge fan of his talent. I think that hopefully he stays healthy as a Jet fan and as an Anunua fan. I think that... Um, <laughs> Just got to note that it wasn't my camera that was messed up. It was my friend's camera who's watching here. Thanks for uh, totally messing up before, dude. Appreciate it. Anyway, back to Anunua. I'm a big Anunua fan. I think there's a ton of talent there. I think they're going to get him the ball. If Anderson's out, he even gets more more targets, 120 targets for Anunua. Huge sleeper potential there. Then the rookie, Anthony Miller in Chicago. Impressing the hell out of everyone in camp, allegedly. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of coach speak, but Miller seems like a guy who, as a rookie, could be a plug-and-play type of guy. You know, 50 catches, 60 catches, 900 yards. Decent for a rookie, not someone I'm going to reach for, but somebody that, you know, you could do a lot worse. And Tier 11, D.D. Westbrook, Ted Ginn, Deshaun Jackson, Amendola, Wilson, Sanu, Cortland Sutton. I'll just talk about Cortland Sutton for a minute. He looks like the profile of a true wide receiver one Demarius and Emmanuel Sanders are, you know, on the later side of their career. There could be some injuries happening there. So, you know, if one of those guys goes down, keep your eye on Cort Cortland Sutton. Uh, he could be a uh, waiver wire hot commodity come, you know, week five or six, let's say. All right, another water break, and then we uh, hit up the tight ends. We're pushing an hour right now almost, but um, – should get it done quickly. Tight ends and QBs, obviously not, not that much to talk about because it's only one per uh, one starter per team in most leagues. So tier one, tight ends. Rob Gronkowski, I'm sure you've heard of him, and uh, Travis Kelsey. Pretty simple. Um, can't go wrong. Gronk, healthy. Obviously, there's an injury risk, but you know, Gronk in the second round to pair with one of your stud running backs or Antonio Brown or Beckham, uh, that would be a scary one-two punch. Travis Kelsey. Not concerned with Alex Smith leaving and Mahomes coming in. I think that offense will still click. I think the defense will be worse, and they'll have to throw it more. So uh, if you want to take Kelsey over Gronk in a tight end premium league, I will um, I will not fight you. Ertz, I moved him down to the tier to tier two. Ertz, Trey Burton, and Evan Ingram. This gets a little crazy here in, in all directions because Ertz, basically across the board, is part of that Gronkowski. Um, Ertz across – sorry, one sec. So Ertz across the board is, is part of that Gronkowski and uh, Kelsey tier. For me, he's um, not as exciting as those other two guys. I, I'd much rather reach and draft my tight end with one of those guys than Ertz. I just think Eagles like to spread the ball around. I think that he is Wentz's favorite target. However, Wentz's TD rate last year was absurd, not sustainable. So I think that knocks Ertz down, you know, not from – nine touchdowns to five or six touchdowns and that that drops him back a tier for me trey burton reaching yes absolutely i'm putting him much higher than most other people he is a hot commodity for sure i think people are going to expect to get him as a steal in the eighth or ninth round when in reality um people like me are going to take him in the uh 
fifth or sixth because he, in Matt Nagy's offense, he is the Kelsey of the offense. And that was the rumor. That's what it was supposed to happen. And all signs are that um, thus far in camp and in preseason, that's exactly what's happening, moving him all across the formation, catching everything his way. We know that he's capable because when he played for Ertz in Philadelphia, he was a stud on a weekly basis. Evan Ingram, concussion scares me a little bit. Um, more targets there and more quality targets in Barkley and now Shepard, obviously healthy, Beckham healthy. Um, maybe not as many balls to go around, but I can't fight the talent. I think Evan Engram is a superstar waiting to happen. And I think that, you know, next year, if you're telling me that it's Gronk, Kelsey, and Engram at the top, um, I buy it. I think there's a case for Engram to actually be the uh, number two receiver behind Beckham in this offense um, over Sterling Shepard, actually. Tier three, Delaney Walker, Jordan Reed, Kyle Rudolph, Doyle, and, and Greg Olson. And any one of these guys can play for me for sure. Um, Delaney Walker, when you're talking about the Titans, everyone loves or everyone a new improved offense with uh, the new coordinator. I believe his name is LaFleur coming over um, to run the offense. Everyone's excited. Everyone's talking about Corey Davis. Everyone's talking about Richard Matthews and the running backs. People are forgetting that Mariota's favorite target is Delaney Walker, and he does it every single year without fail. Uh, he's a little hurt now too, so that's a little bit scary, but um, I'll go to war with Delaney Walker as my guy. Jordan Reed, talk about value, guys. Listen, especially in the position like tight end where there's going to be quality players on the waiver wire, I'm willing to be risky, and if risky means taking a Jordan Reed, a top three tight end that I can get, you know, as the 10th tight end off the board, I'll sign up for that all day. We know Alex Smith likes the tight end. We saw what he did with Kelsey. So um, Jordan Reed seems like a no-brainer value to me. Kyle Rudolph, two years ago, go look at Kyle Rudolph's numbers. The guy uh, gets it done, and now he's got Kirk Cousins. You can argue that that is a pretty solid improvement um, in the passing game. He's obviously got Diggs and Thielen to take up a lot of the uh, defensive attention, and he's a touchdown scorer. So type of tight end in the middle of rounds. If you're not going up top with Gronk or Kelsey and the big dogs, Rudolph is a good middle round guy to slide in. Not that sexy, so it kind of like sneak under the radar a bit. Doyle. So people are trying to talk, talk him down because of the Ebron signing. I am so in on Doyle, especially from what I've seen in the preseason. 80 catches, and that's with Brissett. So I think that you know, like we've talked about a couple times already, Luck is going to throw the ball 600 times. Where are those, where are those targets going to go? Doyle could be that number two guy. He, could, he can potentially be looking at a tight end on an Andrew Luck offense that throws the ball a lot with 110 targets. That's somebody that you can draft as the you know, 10th, 12th tight end off the board that has potential top five tight end value there. I'm all in on Doyle. And Greg Olson... You know, obviously somebody super um, consistent, someone you can count on. The one thing I would say is injury last year. I guess this is two things. An injury last year, and um, like I said when talking about Funchess, a lot more a lot more targets, a lot more target options with uh, Samuel, DJ Moore, Christian McCaffrey, and Funchess around. So that's the only downside with Olsen, but if you're going to roll with him as your tight end one, I can't go wrong. Tier four, all by himself, Jimmy Graham. Why did I put him all by himself? Well, because... I'm not going to be drafting him this year, but I, I get it if you would. He's most likely going to go before my whole tier three. He's going to be the fourth, fifth tight end off the board, and I'll tell you why that um, it's not going to work for me. I only have one minute remaining in my uh, Instagram live. I guess it's almost creeping up on an hour. Silly rule, Instagram, but uh, I'll take it. Instagram people, I'm finishing this up on uh, my Facebook page if you want to come over and uh, – join there you can find me um we're almost done with tight ends then we go quarterbacks that'll take two minutes because they really don't count and uh we'll be done so peace instagram i appreciate you guys joining me earlier uh for the last hour whoever's jumped in and jumped out appreciate the uh the look if you want any of my tears email me chris at chrisheller.me anyhow jimmy graham obviously aaron Rodgers, super red zone target 10 cat 10 touchdowns last year with russell wilson um Here's the thing. Jimmy Grant is getting, getting getting older, slowing down. 
and he might be a guy that all he does is catch touchdowns, which is not someone that I want to take as the fourth or fifth tight end off the board. I think you'll see a lot of weeks that are two catches for 20 yards and a touchdown. And if that equates to 10 touchdowns, great. You probably got some value there. I'd just rather have a guy like a Delaney Walker or Jordan Reed or an Ingram who's going to catch five balls a week. Um, I don't know. Jimmy Graham's just not going to do it for me, guys. Tier five, David Njoku, Tyler Eifert, George Kittle. Uh, Any of these three can play for me. Eifert obviously is the major injury risk, but he's healthy right now. So you can get him as the 15th tight end off the board. You have a potential top five guy on a good offense who's going to be involved, could be the second target there behind A.J. Green. And you know what? Tyler Croft, his backup, is pretty good too. So if Eifert were to go down, like I said with Jordan Reed, tight end is a place in most leagues, unless you're in a heavy tight end premium league, um, like I actually play in a lot, but that's another story. Um, you can take a risk at tight end. So Reed, Eifert, those are guys to target because you can always replace them if they go down. And Joku seems to be on the field like 90% of the plays now on an offense that I think is going to be able to move the ball. He's a freak talent. A um, lot of upside there with Njoku. And George Kittle out with Garoppolo. Again, that offense, if you believe it's going to hum with Jimmy G, uh, as I do, I think Kittle is a monster target, freak athlete that can potentially score, you know, eight, nine touchdowns and be a uh, serious tight end one on a week-to-week basis. Beyond them, Tier 6, not much to talk about in Tier 6 and Tier 7 in the tight end grouping. O.J. Howard, Cameron Brait, Eric Ebron, Ricky Seals-Jones, Austin Safarian Jenkins, Ben Watson, Austin Hooper, and Jared Cook. Out of this group, Seals-Jones stands out to me as somebody who's going to be on the field in an offense in Arizona that does not have that many targets behind Larry Fitzgerald, not that many players. So he's someone that uh, I could be looking at as a tight end, too, that could impress. And then Cook. In Oakland, again, Raiders offense improving. Um, if you don't believe in Jordy, if you don't believe in Cooper, someone's got to be open in the middle of the field, and Cook is that big target. We've seen him and Carr do some stuff before. Uh, I'm probably not going back to the well on Jared Cook, but I can understand if you do. Similarly, Austin Safarian Jenkins uh, out with Bortles in Jacksonville now. A mishmash of talent outside on Jacksonville, so with Cole and Westbrook and no more Marcus Lee, um, Marquise Lee, rather. Big target with Safarian Jenkins clogging up the middle. Could score some touchdowns. Bortles is not as bad as you think, guys. And Tier 7, Clay, Luke Wilson, Vance McDonald, Hurst, Vernon Davis, Ryan Griffin, Nick Vanette, Virgil Green, Mike Gusecki, Dallas Goodert, Jake Butt. Got to end on the butt. Anyway, Ryan Griffin. On the same um, thoughts as the Will Fuller hype, Griffin as the, we think, starting tight end, tight end one in um, in Houston could fall into 80 targets. And uh, we're looking for that at the end of our draft. If you're, in a t- if you're in a tight end premium league, you're looking for guys that can surprise and just grab some targets that you wouldn't expect. Luke Wilson going over to um, Detroit, a, a high athletic profile. You never know what can happen there uh, on the field with Stafford taking those Ebron targets potentially. Some upside there with Luke Wilson. And beyond that, Virgil Green, as of now, with no uh, not signing, re-signing Gates and with uh, Hunter out, Virgil Green seems to be the um, starting tight end on a good offense at a quarterback that seems to historically love the tight end. So Virgil Green could be a thing. Finally, quarterbacks. So we need our sip of water to uh, delineate and denote a, a break in the action. All right, quarterbacks. I should just have a, on the spreadsheet, I should just have a big middle finger um, when you click on this tab because they just don't matter. Remember back in camp, that cheer? It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter, which was ridiculous, by the way. But really, what that was about, we didn't know it then. It was about uh, fantasy QBs because they really don't matter. There are so many viable options in fantasy football this year and most years, um, but even especially this year, if you're not playing in a, two QB league or a super flex league where you need to start two quarterbacks every week, you can wait and wait and wait some more. Um, I don't care if half the leagues already have their backup. I can then take my starter and still be happy. That being said, we still have to rank them a little bit. Uh, So here we go. Tier one, Rodgers, Brady, Russell Wilson. They're great. You know it. I don't need to give too much detail on any of this. 
tier two, Cam Newton, Drew Brees, and Andrew Luck. Um, if either of those guys are presenting value, eighth round, ninth round, tenth round even, that may be a place where I'm willing to step up and grab a QB. One of those three. Otherwise, we let it slide. Tier three, Garoppolo, Ryan, Roethlisberger, Deshaun Watson, Alex Smith, Matt Stafford, Kirk Cousins, Rivers, Mahomes. Let's talk about Watson because he's the consensus QB two. I think that is a massive mistake, massive reach. I think we're going to see a lot more interceptions. Um, I think he has a weak offensive line. I think he's coming off his second ACL tear in three years. And I think his efficiency is impossible to replicate all signs that he is not the QB2. And I would be shocked if he's a top five QB at the end of this year. Uh, good player. And I think Houston's in a good spot for um, for the future with him leading the charge. But fantasy QB2, no thanks. Um, also, from the, I, I basically, essentially, in this tier three, any of these guys can be my starter. Cousins, Matt Ryan, Garoppolo. I'll take any of them. Rivers, no doubt. And even moving on to tier four, Wentz, Dalton, Mariota, Winston, Manning, Carr, Keenum, and Taylor. So Wentz obviously stands out here uh, much lower than most people have him. He's usually a top five to seven guys on most boards. For me, I'm still worried about the injury. Um, I don't trust it. And I think he's a good player. I don't think he's elite, at least not yet. And his um, his touchdown rate last year was off the charts, insane and not repeatable. And he doesn't have that go-to weapon in the passing game. He likes Ertz, obviously, but doesn't have that big guy outside. I'm not counting Alshon as like a wide receiver one stud any longer. Um, so Wentz is just not going to be on my teams. Andy Dalton's a guy I always love. He threw... Um, a career low number of passes last year. That Bengals offense is going to be better. He'll throw 50 more passes and he'll be a potential QB one, certainly a playable QB that you could probably get after 20 or off the board. That's how ridiculous it is. Andy Dalton can start for me. Mariota can start for me. Jameis Winston, obviously he has three game suspension, but keep him around because once he gets on the field, he can sling it with the best of them. Carr, Eli Mann and Case Keenum. These guys are all playable absolutely playable so like i said when it comes to qb wait and wait some more finishing up with tier five dak prescott jared goff trubisky flacco bortles Tannehill, bradford mccown allen i don't love anyone from here however if you tell me that i have to you know play the waiver wire each week and play matchups and one week it's going to be bortles and the next week it's going to be dak and the next week it's going to be flacco i can live with that because i'm going to be so loaded everywhere else because you are wasting two of your early picks on QBs. Uh, it's just one way to approach it, guys. It doesn't have to be the way. It's just my way, most likely. So that's it. An hour and change in. The voice is uh, starting to fade a little bit. And uh, it's almost time to go home. So football season is upon us. We are super psyched. If you want a copy of those tiers um, or just access to uh, the Google Sheets doc because I'll probably change them a little bit in the next 10 days or so while uh, before all my drafts are completed. Um, message me or email me, chris at chrisheller.me or uh, message me on Instagram at chrisheller.me or Twitter, cheller32. And um, that's it. Let's play some football. If you got any questions or you just want to shoot the shit about fantasy, if you hate some of my opinions, love some of them, let me know. And let's uh, let's talk. And for those of you listening on audio, thanks for joining me as always. Another episode of the uh, Talkin' Ish podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.